Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's really great to see so many people on the Zoom, um, see some of you, see names of others of you. Glad all of you have joined us. Um, we've been looking forward to this um, tonight. We're, we're really excited to talk to all of you about re-envisioning public safety and that um, pillar of the people's plan. We're sort of gonna unpack um, how all of, how our work fits with, can you go back one slide actually, Noel? We're gonna unpack how our work fits into a people's plan and explain a little bit about what that is. My name is Blake Strode. I'm the executive director of Arch City Defenders. Uh, joined tonight by three of my colleagues, Inez Bordeaux, manager of community collaborations, Nawel Pfeffer, our Justice Catalyst Fellow, and Madison Orozco, our Community Collaborations Associate, as well as some really special guests. So each of them will, will introduce themselves and our guests in more detail as we go. Um, but to start us off, next slide, please. Uh, as I said, we're gonna be talking about re-envisioning public safety as a pillar of the people's plan. So I wanted to start out for those who may be less familiar by talking a little bit about the people's plan at a high level um, and sharing with you how this fits into a broader uh, policy agenda that, that Arch City Defenders was really happy to sign on to. So I'm uh, gonna ask Nawel to, to um, navigate over to the People's Plan website, which this is all at peoplesplanstl.org. So after this event, if you haven't been to this site, I highly recommend um, you go to peoplesplanstl.org and poke around. There's a lot of great stuff there. So the People's Plan is a comprehensive policy agenda. You see here on the landing page, there's sort of a description of what um, brought us and many of our partners to put together this plan for the city of St. Louis. It's built around four pillars. And you see at the bottom of the, um, the landing page, there's a very long list of partners that are a part of this collaborative project. So of course, I will not say all of those. We launched with um, 28 organizations originally, and now I think we're up to 44 or 45. It grows by the week. Um, I sort of lose track of the number, but, but it's a really, um, I think, powerful reflection of the level of alignment and partnership that exists in St. Louis, um, and that many people and organizations are really aligned around a transformative agenda for this city and for our region. Um, the, the website itself has lots of great information on it. As I said, if you look at the top banner, um, if you can scroll all the way up to the top, actually, if you look at the top banner, you see we've got people surveys, there's, there's actually debate video and um, answers from candidates, uh, including the, the two mayoral candidates who are still in the runoff, all of the board of, of aldermen candidates that are running, they responded to questions connected to the people's plan, you can find all of that. But what we're going to focus on tonight uh, is one of the four pillars. Um, there are four pillars of the plan that you saw on the slide. And the one we're focusing on tonight is re-envisioning public safety. So the, the problem statement that you see here is that our city must divest from the predatory and expensive arrest and incarcerate model of public safety and invest in communities, an approach that has proven to reduce violence and actually keep people safe. And there are four priority issues that are spelled out in this collaborative policy agenda. And each of these four, um, are the, the four sections that we're gonna kind of dig into over the course of this conversation. Um, so really excited to do that and to dive into details. But the, actually, go back one second. The one other thing that, that I really wanna emphasize here is if you scroll all the way down, now well, at the bottom of each um, uh, pillar page, we have a resource guide. And the resource guide lays out community resources, things you can watch, read, study, learn from, campaigns that you can plug into, volunteer for, become a member, and anchor organizations. So all of those organizations that are behind the People's Plan um, are listed under each pillar where they're anchor organizations. So this is a direct answer to the question that, that I'm anticipating that we always get every time we, we do any sort of public event. What can I do to help? How can I plug in? The answer is right here in these resource guides. So please go to peoplesplanstl.org, um, check out the platform, check out the resource guides, and there's so many ways to learn more and plug in. Uh, okay, so back to our agenda here. As I said, the the there are four pillars, making STL home, funding our future, building inclusive democracy, and re-envisioning public safety. Next slide, please. 
And the four um, issue priorities under re-envisioning public safety are one, decriminalizing poverty, drug use, protest, and sex work. Two, close the workhouse. Three, divest from policing, invest in real public safety and for anti-surveillance. So those are the four issues that we're gonna sort of take in turn tonight, starting with, next slide, uh, decriminalization. So specifically decriminalizing poverty, drug use, protest, and sex work. So I thought it would be helpful actually to start here as we answer the question of how Arch City Defenders work connects to um, this part of the people's plan with our vision statement. And I'm just gonna read it. Arch City Defenders envisions a society liberated from systems of oppression, where the promise of justice and racial equity is realized, communities where our approach to public safety prioritizes investment in well being, health, and transformation without relying on criminalization and incarceration, and people living freely in their communities, thriving regardless of their race or income. And the piece of this that I really want to emphasize is that language of without relying on criminalization and incarceration. Because for us, it's really critical that the, the transformation we are fighting for and really envision for our region and our folks is one where we have turned away from this reliance on criminalization and incarceration. So as a starting point, I think it's really helpful to, to try to answer the question of what do we really mean by criminalization? We hear this word a lot, but what does it mean? So. I went to Oxford Dictionary and asked them, and there are two parts to the definition that you'll find if you just Google the word criminalization. And the first is the action of turning an activity into a criminal offense by making it illegal. The second part of the definition is the action of turning someone into a criminal by making their activities illegal. So I think this is a really helpful frame to start with because it, it gets to um, a really crucial component of, of criminalization, which is that it is about actions and activities and conduct, and it's also about particular people. And I think it's really hard to understand criminalization fully and the ways in which we criminalize people in our society fully without both thinking about conduct and thinking about people and, and identity of people. Um, so we're gonna dig into both of those starting with a, a really concrete example um, around drug use. So if you're a Denzel Washington fan like me, you may recognize this image. This is from uh, the movie American Gangster. And in it, Denzel Washington plays a, a sort of infamous, um, described as drug kingpin Frank Lucas, um, who sort of came up in the 60s and 70s in Harlem in New York. And part of what is captured in the film is the, the moment in our history in which all of the resources of state, federal, local governments really started going after, and this was in part um, sort of timed with the rise of crack cocaine in many urban communities across the country, really started going hard into communities of color, in particular poor communities of color especially, and arresting charging, sentencing in mass, um, black and brown people, particularly black and brown men. And so when we see these uh, images of drugs and criminals, what you tend to see is a lot of folks in urban settings, mostly people of color, black and brown, um, especially young men. And we've had generations that have moved through this cycle of criminalization and incarceration connected to drug use in that context. But of course, we know that's not the only context in which people use drugs. So here's another image that might be familiar to some. Uh, and this was the result of me typing into a Google search college drug use. And many images like this came up. And I always make the point, uh, anytime I, I'm speaking to a college audience or on a college campus, I am fond of making the point that if we really wanted to identify places where drug use is frequent, we could raid any college dormitory anywhere in America and be fairly certain to find some illegal drugs present in that setting. Now that doesn't happen, that hasn't really happened. We don't have ex any expectation of that happening. And that really speaks to, again, the fact that criminalization really not only focuses on activity like use of certain drugs, but also on people, 
on criminalizing certain people. And so this is a really stark example where you can see um, that the same or very similar activity is treated very differently um, given how we approach crime and criminalization in this country. Next slide, please. Uh, so was there one before this? Yes. Um, so this is a quote from Michelle Alexander, um, who of course wrote the New Jim Crow best-selling book. Uh, Nothing has contributed more to the systematic mass incarceration of people of color in the United States than the war on drugs. And we've seen that proven to be true time and time again. And one way, next slide, please. Um, one way is if you really look again in the context of drugs, if you look at who gets criminalized. So these are um, just a few stats from the Drug Policy Alliance, another really good, good resource to um, learn more about this issue. And despite roughly equal drug usage rates across races, and that is sort of proven out again and again in all of the, the social science that we have, nearly 80% of people in federal prison for drug offenses are Black or Latinx, 80%. Nearly 60% of people in state prison for drug offenses are Black or Latinx. And we also see the same sort of disparity in punishment and levels of punishment and sentencing. So even if you look at people that are already in the criminal legal system, already have been arrested, already have been charged, prosecutors are twice as likely to pursue mandatory minimum sentences for black people as for white people charged with the same offense. So all of this really begins to give a clear picture of how criminalization operates in, in our context, but we know that's not limited to drugs. That's one powerful example, but what are some other examples of criminalization and, and particularly racialized criminalization and enforcement? One is vehicle stops, right? And we've certainly seen our fair share of um, issues and, and um, trauma around vehicle stops in the St. Louis region, right? We've seen these really high profile instances uh, and every single year, one of the things we can bet on, like clockwork, is that we get a headline like this every time the, the Attorney General, Missouri Attorney General, releases the annual vehicle stops report. It shows continuing disparities between Black and white drivers. Specifically, it tends to show that Black drivers are disproportionately stopped, that of those stopped, Black drivers are disproportionately searched, of those searched, Black drivers are disproportionately uh, arrested. And you might think that that suggests, you know, it might be intuitive based on those numbers that there's a higher amount of contraband that, that's yielded in those searches. But in fact, we learned just the opposite year after year after year, that actually what's called the contraband hit rate, meaning the amount of times they find illegal things in the vehicles is actually lower for black drivers than white drivers. And yet, this disparity continues year after year after year. Another example would be around uh, poverty and homelessness and the way that poverty and homelessness are treated and criminalized. And I think especially in the context of the city of St. Louis where we continue to have a real, um, real challenges, significant challenges around unhoused populations. Um, we really see this again and again and again with uh, ordinances like that, that criminalize panhandling, trespassing, loitering, uh, public intoxication, public nuisance. Um, I, we've seen people charged with indecent exposure because they were urinating in a park in open view because they didn't have access to a bathroom. Sleeping on benches, you see there, sleep, it's not a crime. Time and time again, the activity of people who are living most on the margins are captured not by uh, public entities that provide support and services, but rather that punish and criminalize and prosecute. Next slide, please. Protest is another place where we see this. And of course, again, in St. Louis, um, we've had some, some recent examples of this, of course, that stand out. Those images on the left are from Ferguson. Um, we've seen similar dynamics, whether in the Ferguson uprising in the wake of the um, Stockley uh, protests in the wake of George Floyd's killing this summer. Time and time again, we see protests, particularly where that protest is made up of Black people treated uh, with a certain degree of aggression, 
um, and seen as criminal behavior. And you can juxtapose that to the immediate police response, at least that we saw on January 6th in the, in the insurrection at the Capitol. That's a, what that photograph is from. And I wanna be clear that you know, Arch, City Defender, Arch City Defenders is an abolitionist organization, wouldn't propose more criminalization for anyone, but it is really important to note where we see these very different responses and very different dynamics around policing and law enforcement in response to different people, even where the, the conduct is very similar. Next slide, please. Uh, and the last, the last in this sort of series would be around sex work. And this is one that I think oftentimes gets left out of the conversation, but it's really important when we think about the role that criminalization plays with respect to racial control, social control, economic control, uh, it also plays a really important role around patriarchal control. And there's a very long legacy. So I would really encourage people um, to read, and this is one of the resources you, you will see on that resource guide page from Moho Justice Coalition and ACLU put out this great report called The State of the Hustle, um, and it, it provides a lot of firsthand um, accounts of, of sex workers and their experience with the police and um, how that's actually made their lives so much harder and worse, um, and a lot of really important data and um, and ways to better understand why it is that criminalization in the context of sex work actually really exacerbates problems and doesn't, doesn't um, help to address any of the challenges that we face. So all of this really adds up to an arrest and incarcerate status quo of public safety. What we mean by that, and I think these images are really instructive um, because you part of what this represents is that there tends to be and over, not there tends to be, there is always predictably an over-representation of people of color in the system. You see these dollar bills wrapped around the bars sort of symbolizing the way that money has a, a, a corrupting influence in this system, whether in the, the form of people who are or are not able to pay anything from traffic tickets to fines and fees to cash bail, or even more fundamentally people who by their very economic class and station are sort of opted out of, of our system of criminalization, whereas others are very naturally pulled into it. Um, that's what our arrest and incarcerate status quo looks like. And there are a few um, costs that I wanna underscore. On the next slide, please. Um, there are budgetary implications of this. There are mass incarceration implications. And then of course, there's a human toll. And I'm not gonna spend time on the, the first of those. Now, Well's gonna really unpack that in the next section, but I want to talk a little bit about mass incarceration and the human toll um, before I hand it over. So don't worry that you can't read everything on here. Um, this is a chart of world incarceration rates if every US state were a country. So every bar, gray bar that you see here is a state in the United States of America, and the only countries represented are the orange bars that you see. So what I'll tell you is that if you could read that uh, those words on the left, you would see that Missouri is the 10th highest incarceration rate. And sorry, go back one. That Missouri is the 10th highest incarceration rate and that the United States of America is the first orange bar. And then the only other orange bars that even make it onto this part of the graph are El Salvador, Turkmenistan, Cuba, Thailand, Rwanda, countries that we don't exactly think of as having the highest and best records of human rights and you know, democratic protections. Uh, and we incarcerate people at much higher rates than those places. Next slide. These are probably countries we're much more familiar with, think of ourselves as being really in league with in that sense. And you see that what, what we do both in the United States and in Missouri is really completely out of proportion to anywhere else in the rest of the world. And St. Louis, I'll tell you, it has the highest incarceration rate of anywhere in the state of Missouri. So if we had a bar for St. Louis, that would be off of this slide. So really extreme practices in terms of incarceration. Next, please. So just a few numbers, I'm gonna run through these quickly. Um, 500,000 in local jails and wealth-based detention across the country, 11 million people per year cycle through local jails, 2.3 million are in prisons nationwide, so state prisons as, as opposed to jails. The United States incarcerates black men at a rate six times that of South Africa at the height of apartheid. And we're told many stories about who is being captured, who's being arrested, who's being criminalized. And it tends to 
circle around violence. And there's a reason that, that proponents of the system do that. The reality is that the vast majority, 94% of all arrests are actually for what we classify as nonviolent crimes. And, and it's really important for us to sort of push on that violent, nonviolent distinction. But even accepting those categories, the system is doing a lot more on the nonviolent side of things than on the violent side. And while we're spending all of these resources, half a million people every day experiencing homelessness in this country. Next slide. This is just in the state of Missouri. As I said, 10th highest incarceration rate in the country and the world. Um, 51,000 Missourians are incarcerated. Jail and prison population is 39% Black, even though the state population is only 12% Black. So you see this major racial disparity. Over 80% of the jail population across the state are pretrial detainees, so folks that haven't had their day in court, who haven't been convicted yet. And it's really important to remember that 20,000 people every single year are released from Missouri prison. So these are our neighbors, coworkers, people you see in the grocery store, people you see on the street are coming out back into our communities every day. And it's really important to think about how we're treating people. Uh, and then recidivism rates, not my preferred term, but uh, just refers to the, um, the pattern of people that rotate back into jail that, that are released and at some point find their way back into jail, estimated at over 40%. So this is one of the many ways we can look and say this really isn't working if it's supposed to, um, to be providing some sort of long-term deterrence and, and correction. Uh, and last but not least, um, the human toll, and you can, you can just do all of these bullets at once, Noah. Um, the human toll is so great. So there are compounding legal issues. We see this all the time in our city, criminal, housing, family, consumer, access to benefits that are blocked by criminal legal involvement, uh, discrimination and barriers to housing and employment, substance use and mental health challenges that both make it more likely to be criminalized and also are made worse by criminalization and incarceration. Uh, the same is true for physical health. There's a great deal of medical neglect in jails and prisons and, and a lack of healthcare access upon release. And then really significant family strain and inadequate community support. So uh, coming back to the people's plan and the elements of the re-envisioning public safety um, or the decriminalization issue under the re-envisioning public safety pillar in the people's plan. Next, next slide. Uh, there are four, four priority um, demands within this, this subset of, of re-envisioning public safety. So one is repealing all ordinances with criminal penalties related to poverty, drug use, protest, or sex work from the municipal code. The second is adopting enforcement policies that decriminalize these offenses, which are rooted in a legacy of racial, social, and patriarchal control. Reduce the size and scope of the city municipal court, which oversees many of these poverty crimes. So this is where a lot of, a lot of these so-called offenses are being adjudicated. Um, and the last, which I don't have a lot of time for tonight, but abandoning the practice by the city councilor's office of using criminal or municipal charges to extract waivers of civil claims against city officers. This is a really common practice. It's actually being litigated right now, not by us, um, where those who have valid claims against city officials then find themselves being charged with, with some of these um, low level offenses as a way of, of creating a bargaining chip and we're calling on that practice to end. Um, so that is, that is the uh, brief exploration of, of decriminalization as, as part of our presentation tonight. We have a few minutes, we're gonna pause in between each to see if there are any immediate questions that are coming up. Um, so we have a few minutes for that if there are any questions now before I hand it over to uh, Inez to talk about um, close the workhouse. So you can either put those in the chat or uh, I think people are able to come off mute if they um, wanna quickly speak a question before we go to the next section. I'll give it a few seconds and then I'll hand over the reins to Inez. Okay, great. And we're also gonna hold some time at the end after we've made it through everything for, for hopefully a little more question, um, Q and A and discussion. So uh, Inez, I will hand it over to you to talk about the workhouse and closing the workhouse. Okay, thanks Blake. 
Um, my name is Inez Bordeaux. I am the manager of community collaborations at Arch City Defenders. I am also an organizer with the Close to Workhouse campaign. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so first we're going to talk about just a tiny bit of history about the workhouse. Um, the workhouse has existed in one form or another in St. Louis since about 1860. The first version of the workhouse was actually right here on um, in the south side of St. Louis, literally a, about a mile from where I'm sitting now. Um, near the corner of Chippewa and uh, Broadway. It was actually built on a rock quarry and it got its name, the workhouse, because if you owed a debt to society or you owed someone money, you could literally go to the workhouse and break up rocks to pay off of your debt, to, uh, excuse me, pay off your debt. The current iteration of the workhouse, the picture we're looking at right now, has been there since about 1964. The wild thing about the workhouse is the complaints of inhumane, unconstitutional conditions have existed since the very first workhouse was opened way back in the 1860s. And those complaints continue um, all the way until today. Um, the workhouse, no matter the form, is a living, breathing monument to white supremacy and racism right here in St. Louis. And we know it is that because the population of the workhouse is made up 90% of Black people. And in St. Louis City, St. Louis City is 49% Black. So to have a, a, an institution that is made up 90% of Black folks made up of poor folks, um, I think really tells you everything that we need to know. The people that are inside of the workhouse are the vast majority of them are being held pretrial, meaning they've been charged with a crime, but they haven't been convicted of anything. And literally the only reason people are languishing away inside of this jail is because they're too, full, they're too poor to be able to buy their freedom. Next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna try to run through the timeline very quickly. Um, the efforts to close the workhouse have really been going on for generations. This campaign to close the workhouse is not the first attempt that has been made to close this jail, um, but our work at Arch City Defenders has gone back several years at this point. Um, many of you may remember the historic heat wave that we had in St. Louis back in 2017. Right before that heat wave started, one of our partners in the work that we're doing, Action St. Louis, crowd they crowdsourced funding to bail Black women out of CJC and the workhouse for Mother's Day. We call it the Black Mama Bailout. And as they were bailing these women out and other people out of the jail, um, we started hearing all of these wild stories about the conditions that people were being forced to live in inside of the jail. We're talking about the black mold, the roaches, the rats, the gladiator fights. Um, we're talking about the toilets that don't flush and the showers that don't work and water that leaks from the ceiling. We're talking about the water that smells funny and the inadequate in nutritious food that people were bit, were being given. Um, and in hearing all of those stories, that led to November of 2017 when the Cody case was filed. Um, I'm gonna refer to it a lot as the conditions case that helps me keep them straight in my mind. Um, so the Cody case that Arch City Defenders filed was all about the inhumane unconstitutional conditions that people were being forced to live in inside of the workhouse. That Cody case and all of those stories that we were hearing led to the Close the Workhouse campaign that was launched in April of 2018. The launching of the campaign was anchored at that time by four organizations, more Arch City Defenders, The Bail Project, and Action St. Louis. They all came together and said, hey, the people are calling for the closure of this jail. Let's start this campaign and see what we can do. Um, and so after the campaign launched, the very first big thing that we did was the close the report, or excuse me, the close the workhouse report 
1.0. If you are interested in reading that report, um, you can find it at close the workhouse at, excuse me, you can find it at close the workhouse.org. In that report, we lay out all the reasons why the workhouse should be closed, the things that we could do with that money if we closed it. And you get to see and hear from the personal stories of people who've been directly impacted by the workhouse. Um, in January of 2019, Arch City Defenders filed the Dixon case. I'm gonna get a little more, I'm gonna get more detailed into the Cody and Dixon case, but the Dixon case was the cash bail case. Um, the reason why that is important because the workhouse literally would not exist without the existence of cash bail. If cash bail did not exist, if people weren't, weren't being forced to languish in jail um, because they couldn't afford to buy their freedom, it wouldn't exist, there would be no need for it. In June of 2019, um, Arch City Defenders won an injunction by a federal judge. Um, and I'm gonna go into that a little bit more later because it was, it was a pivotal time in this city and we got to see the effects that ending cash bail would really have. Um, January of 2020, we released the Close the Workhouse Report 2.0. Um, the report 2.0, again, you can read that on the Close the Workhouse website also, but really addressed all of the gaps and holes that the first report um, did not address. And we tried to answer a lot of the questions that not only elected officials have, but people in the community had. Um, and then we roll right into March 2020, and that's when COVID hit. And we got to see uh, increased demand for people being released from jail and the close the, the workhouse being closed because jails are vectors for viruses to spread. Inside of a jail, you typically don't have access to PPE, um, you don't have access to cleaning supplies. It is impossible to social distance inside of a jail. So that is one of the reasons why we saw increased demand that the jail be closed. In July of 2020, there was the unanimous passage of Ordinance 71217 to close the workhouse by December 31st of 2020. And last but not least, in November of 2020, Board Bill 167 was filed. And I'm going to get into all of that in more detail, I promise. Next slide, please. Okay, Cody versus the city of St. Louis. Um, our city defenders filed this case in November of 2017 after hearing the stories and experiences of many people who re were released from the workhouse during the summer bailouts with Action St. Louis. Sent seven plaintiffs in that case, including plaintiff James Cody, shared experiences of inhumane conditions, including extreme temperatures, rodent and insect infestations, mold, overcrowding, retaliation by jail guards. These conditions violate the constitutional rights of our clients and other class members in that case. After three and a half years and many fights to get access to the information and documentation, we are still litigating this fight and we will continue to fight to get justice and compensation for our clients. Dixon versus the city of St. Louis. Um, Arch City Defenders and Co-Counsel filed this case in January of 2019 to challenge the cash bail and pretrial detention practices in the city courts and jails that have kept our clients and thousands, thousands of class members locked up because of their poverty. Um, this case has been an important avenue for attacking the unconstitutional system of pretrial detention that keeps so many hundreds caged in our jails every single day, both in CJC and the workhouse. After we won a preliminary injection in the Dixon case in June of 2019, we saw one of the most significant drops in the city jail population in the last few years. This last bullet point is the one that I really want to get into. 
after this injunction was won by our city defenders and our co-counsel, what happened was people who were languishing inside of jails, both the workhouse and CJC, finally got the level of constitutional bail hearing that they deserved. One, one that took um, their income level and other things about their life into account in making a decision about whether or not someone should be released on bail. And remember, bail is not about safety. It's never been about safety. Bail is about simply ensuring that you come back to court to have your case adjudicated. And after this ruling, about 190 people in one week received bail hearings that had not had, who had not had them, or there had been several months since um, a judge last took a look at their bail case. And out of that 190 people, almost 120 people were released or able to get bonded out at a much lower rate. That is the importance of ending cash bail in St. Louis. It's not about safety. It's about making sure people can come back to court. And this right here shows that if you release people on their own recognizance to fight their case from home, they will come back and adjudicate their case. And our partners at the Bail Project prove that every single day. Next slide, please. Okay, so I want to talk just a little bit about my own personal journey with the workhouse. Um, I am a survivor of domestic violence, um, many, many years of domestic violence in a very long marriage. And when I did finally work up the courage and have the ability to leave, um, there was one problem. There were no resources available. There was no one that I could turn to for help. I personally could not afford um, to pay the childcare bill that I had in leaving my husband, my now ex-husband. When I left, I took, you know, my four children with me. My children at the time were eight, six and a half, a year and a half, and six months old. My daycare bill alone was $1,600 a month. And I was working as a nurse at the time. I made pretty decent money. I was bringing home about $2,800 a month. And I could not afford to pay my rent and my daycare in the same month. So I was constantly in this vicious cycle of facing eviction and also not being able to drop my kids off at daycare. If I couldn't drop my kids off at daycare, I couldn't go to work. Um, and because of that, I had a choice to make. I could either do something illegal, commit a crime, or I could go back to the man who picked up a hot skillet off of a stove and burned me all over my body with it. So I chose to commit a crime in order to survive. After I lost two jobs because I didn't have affordable childcare, I decided that I was going to draw unemployment benefits and I was going to keep drawing unemployment benefits. And that $350 I received from the state every week is how I was able to afford my childcare. And because of that decision I made, I spent seven years inside of the criminal legal system. Um, I spent seven years, seven whole years, um, time where I had to send my kids away because I was homeless for three years. I couldn't find a job for two and a half years and just being spent up inside of this system. Now, I only spent 30 days inside of the workhouse from March to April of 2016. And when we talk about seven years, 30 days is but a drop in the bucket when it comes to seven years. But that 30 days that I spent inside of the workhouse radicalized me um, because I was able to see firsthand what people were talking about. If you are black in this city, you either have been to the workhouse or you know someone who's been to the workhouse. We've all heard the stories and many people, I mean, just like I was at that time, I didn't, I didn't think that the conditions were that bad, but it turned out that they were. Um, and that led me to being a volunteer, uh, first a member of the Close the Workhouse campaign, and then a volunteer. 
which eventually led to me being the manager of community collaborations at Arch City Defenders. Next slide. So what I want to do now before I get into the organizing is introduce someone that I met as a volunteer organizer with the campaign um, long before I was manager of community collaborations, Jocelyn Garner. Jocelyn Garner is a mother. She is a grandmother. She is a fierce advocate for closing the workhouse. And it is my extreme pleasure to introduce her to all of you. Jocelyn, you there? Yeah, I'm here. How you doing? Hi. Hey. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to ask you a couple of questions, if that's OK. That's fine. That's cool. OK. Can first tell Tell us when you were in the workhouse and how long you spent there. So I was in the workhouse for about six, five, six months in 2018. Yeah, from like March to uh, August, September. Yeah. Okay, so tell the people who are joining us on this call a little bit about what you experienced inside of the workhouse. <laughs> so from like the jump it's just completely inhumane you know that you're going you know to be mistreated like they spray you with bug spray like to even get into a place that's more nastier than i'm assuming with their you know trying to stop from coming in you know what i mean they feed you like trash i mean it's just it's inedible it's inhumane your your living conditions you know where they, the people that they group you up with, you know, like I don't judge anyone, but you know, I'm not a drug user like that. And, you know, I wouldn't want to be put into a cell, into a close quarter cell with someone who's coming off of heroin, you know, that involves a lot of vomit, a lot of fluids, a lot of everything. And they don't have the adequate cleaning supplies to get that up out of there. You know what I mean? So therefore, I'm exposed to whatever it is this person just, you know, expelled out there. You know, so it's very inhumane up in that place. You know, the food is very inedible and just the way that they treat you. Like, it's like a textbook that you have to treat every one of us that comes through the door like some kind of animal. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. And you all are gonna get to hear from Jocelyn a little more later, um, but I wanna get into just really quickly what organizing has looked like around the Close to Workhouse campaign. Um, I really miss being able to organize in person. You see these pictures, we're not wearing masks. This was pre, this was pre COVID. Um, organizing with the Close the Workhouse campaign has looked like really intentional base building in the communities most affected by the policies that allow the workhouse to exist. So that means Black people, poor people, the unhoused community um, is where we go. And despite what you may hear from some elected officials, guess what? Anywhere that there was a marginalized person who could have been impacted by these systems, we were there. We were there organizing in their communities. We were there talking to them. We were there asking them what their demands were. And, and we were asking them to dream big, to imagine a world without the workhouse, to imagine a world where we had, at that time, $16 million to reinvest in our communities. And as you can see from these pictures, organizing looked like us showing up at Board of Aldermen meetings and packing the room with our people wearing our shirts and our signs and our buttons and demanding the closure of the workhouse. It looked like us um, working in collaboration with other alders to get resolutions introduced to, close, to defund and close the workhouse. It looked like us following the mayor everywhere she went to demand that she close the workhouse, whether that was city hall or that was showing up outside of radio stations when she was going to appear. 
organizing during a pandemic included all of those same things that I just mentioned, except we did it all online. And I have to pat the Close the Workhouse team on the back. Organizing during a pandemic was really, really difficult, but we did it. We did it through organizing power hours where people could jump on a call with us and call their elected officials or call people in certain wards. It looked like us putting out graphics in who supported the Close the Workhouse campaign and who didn't. It looked like us doing member kickbacks online if we needed to. It, looks like, it looked like us tapping into our partnership with Ben and Jerry's to have billboards put up all over the city. And it also looked like us going out to the workhouse and having rallies excuse me, rallies and caravans um, to continue to apply pressure and keep close the workhouse on everyone's tongues. Next slide, please. So last but not least, I wanna get into the CTW legislative history. Ordinance seven, excuse me, 71217 was the bill that passed back in in July um, that the Board of Aldermen unanimously voted for. We really did think they were serious and this was a good faith effort to close the workhouse, but we now know that the unanimous support came at a cost. City leaders chose to read the bill as non-binding. They chose to read it as this was um, a bill to put forth a plan to close the workhouse and not actually close it which led us to the introduction of Board Bill 167 by you know, support of alders at the Board of Aldermen. That bill, what it would do is defund the workhouse and reallocate funds to programs and services that the city desperately needs, like $3.3 million to the Division of Supportive Reentry and the Re-Envisioning Public Safety Fund. Despite efforts to block its introduction in November of 2020, Board Bill 167 finally got a hearing in January. Afraid of the political consequences of voting against it, Alders simply dropped out of the Zoom. They literally left the meeting so that they wouldn't be a quorum and it couldn't be voted on. Many Alders who supported Board Bill 212, which was a bill to uh, put close the workhouse on the, on the ballot, intentionally stayed away from the meetings where Board Bill 167 could be voted on. Um, it is very clear that a lot of our elected officials had no um, had no intention on putting forth a good faith effort to close the workhouse. What's next? The budget cycle. Um, we can defund the workhouse in this next budget cycle starting April 21st. Um, we will have a new mayor and the budget will be presented to the Board of e and a And during this period that runs from the end of April to the end of June, we have an opportunity to make sure the workhouse is not only defunded, but those um, dollars, that $8 million that's budgeted for the next fiscal year can be reinvested in people and communities as it should be. I'm going to close there and pause to see if there are any questions. I know I've covered a ton of information. I know, I know one question we wanted to make sure we asked of Jocelyn tonight is just um, what it would mean to you, Jocelyn, to see the workhouse closed and what it means to you to see this work happening and this movement happening around closing the workhouse. <laughs> What it would look like to me to see the workhouse clothes would look like hope, you know, especially giving light into, you know, the new things that's happening. Like they're trying to close down the historically black high school. Some, you know, I don't see no one fighting for that as much as they're fighting to keep this workhouse open, you know, this place of uh, destruction and, you know, the humanization and making gladiators out of regular everyday people, you know, because that's how you got to be to survive in a place like this, you know? And I feel like all that could be done with all the money that's being spent in there, that's not helping anyone, could be done better in like outreach programs or more educational stuff, you know? So it, it would definitely look like hope to me and especially because I'm raising three black males, 
You know, I feel like they would have a better chance at education than just selling to be like everybody else, like it's popular or it's the thing to do to go to jail. So I feel like without this jail, we can show our future, you know, our children and their children that there's something more to look forward to that you don't have to be what, you know, people say that you have to be because you're a black person and, and, and you have it hard. You know, that's how I feel. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Jocelyn. I meant to ask you that before I jumped away, and I was just so excited to see you that I forgot all about it. So thank you for that. Okay, you too. Thank you. So I don't think I see any other questions. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Noel. Thanks, Inez. I'll just uh, share my screen again real quick. And I'm going to be talking about the budget. Um, I'm going to be talking about what it looks like today and, and what it could look like um, with a new vision uh, guiding our priorities. And the first thing to understand is that the budget's a moral document and it's also designed to be inaccessible. The budget process is designed as a bureaucratic game. And what we're going to try to do is break down some of those barriers to entry uh, and try to explain where the money goes. Um, but if you have any questions, write them down. We'll try to address them. Um, so we're going to mostly talk about the general fund, um, which, as you can see in that image, 55% of the general fund is allocated to public safety just 0.5% is allocated to health and human services. And that's a statement of priorities, right? We spend $2 million on SLMPD communication services, that's their radios. And we spend a million dollars on their wearing apparel, that's their uniforms and riot gear. And we spend 1.3 million on the entire department, actually. It says Director of Human Services, but it's the Department of Human Services. Um, and same with the health department from the general fund. They do get certain grant funds and special revenues. But, but that's the general fund is the most flexible pot of money. It's half a billion dollars that we choose where it goes. As for other revenues, special revenues are generally legally restricted um, or, or can be passed through money. Enterprise funds, uh, that's 245 million, are also restricted to the water department and the airport. So those are fees that those departments generate and that stay inside there. And then grants are obviously restricted to the specific uses. And that's the city budget. It's over a billion dollars, and we're going to be focusing on the general fund. So that first graphic came from the city's budget. But what we're showing here um, is a graphic we put together that organizes the general fund in a slightly different way. Um, and first of all, it, instead of talking about public safety, it talks about the criminal legal system, because public safety also includes fire um, and excise and a few other pieces that we threw under operations. But here we can look at the criminal legal system and see the $250 million that our city spends from its general fund on policing, jails, 46 million, that's the CJC, the workhouse, and the juvenile detention center, and our judicial offices, that's circuit courts and city courts and the sheriffs. That's 250 million. And contrast with what's on top of there, social services, which we spend $6 million on, 2 million to neighborhood stabilization, 1.3 million to human services, 1.2 million to the Division of Recreation, and that 800,000 we talked about to the health department. And then again, just to kind of give you a feel for the money and put things in context, we spend $40 million on government administration, which includes both the mayor's office, comptroller's office, board of aldermen's office, county services, county offices, as well as personnel department, legal, budget, IT, all, all that stuff. And then finally, uh, we spend $22 million of, on debt, uh, $21 million of which is on the convention center. We, we have a lot more debt, but it's typically in special revenues um, because there are taxes that are specifically directed to pay off certain pieces of debt. Um, and then $160 million on operations, on our fire department, on streets, refuse, parks, forestry, on maintaining city facilities, uh, and maintaining the city's fleet, which is what the Board of Public Service does. So that's one way to think about it. Now we're going to drill down into the police department. Um, 
And here, uh, the first thing I want to highlight is that this is actually not just the police department, it's also the police retirement system, which handles police pensions and police units. There are four city departments that have specific units dedicated to servicing the police department. And that's the law department, which has a $5 million police unit. That's equipment services, which basically maintains uh, the police uh, fleet of vehicles. Um, that's facilities management, which basically upkeeps uh, police property. And that's the personnel department's police unit, um, which handles HR uh, for, for the police. Um, but on top of that, there's also the medical examiner's office, which is their corner. Um, but those are the, the pieces that are reflected in this $175 million uh, budget that the city allocates to serve the function of policing. And the first thing you notice is that biggest category is pensions and retirement. Um, and, and it's just important to emphasize how out of control that number is. Um, the city spends $6.5 million of general fund money for pensions for every other city employee. Um, if you expand it out to special revenues, we spend $39 million on the police department and $13 million on every other city employee. Um, so we know there's a lot of problems there, but frankly, no, no mayor has been able to wrap their arms around it and get it under control um, because we've only even had a chance to do that since local control in 2014. Another thing that I wanna draw folks' attention to is, is patrol, where we see that only one, less than 20% uh, of the budget uh, is allocated to actually folks on the street. So when you think about what it means to defund the police, I uh, just want to deconstruct that that actually won't necessarily impact uh, the presence on, on the street. And the other thing I'll note there is that it's just interesting that the, uh, so South, South Patrol is the first and second district, Central Patrol, which is really downtown, is the third and fourth district, um, and North Patrol uh, is the fifth and sixth district. If you tally it up, North Patrol has the least funding in spite of being the site of, of the greatest amount of violent crime. And, and it speaks to the fact that as Blake was pointing out, police actually don't spend most of their time dealing with violent crime. They spend most of their time dealing with property crime and maintaining the property status quo. Another thing I, I wanna draw attention to is the administration bucket, because that really shouldn't necessarily be there, certainly be, be that large. Uh, one of the intent, the intent of local control was to end duplicative administration. But right now, uh, the SLMPD and the city both have separate budget departments, supply departments, communications departments, and IT departments. Um, and, and again, that, that matters in terms of the degree of control that the city has over the police. So take budget. We have uh, the city's budget department has a budget of less than half a million dollars. SLMPD's budget department has a budget of $1 million. What does that mean? We actually don't exercise granular budgetary control of SLMPD. If you look in the city's line item, this is detailed budgetary information pulled directly from SLMPD through a sunshine request. But if you actually look at the city's public line item budget, what's passed by the Board of Estimate Apportionment and by the Board of Aldermen, you'll see a line item that just says 900 police officers. So say we defund that by $5 million. We don't control where the police officers come out of, where we defund those police officers. So we couldn't choose to defund SWAT, which is a special unit there, or we couldn't choose to defund the shot spotter program because we, we don't actually have that granular budgetary control. So that's extremely important. And then I'll also note uh, that training is just a relatively small number compared to what you might expect. And we'll get into some more details um, further down the line. Um, specifically, here's the budget cut a different way. Um, and, and now we're not only looking at the general fund, we're actually looking at police spending per officer um, in special funds as well uh, as, uh, as in uh, grant monies. Um, and what we see, first of all, is uh, the, the huge number that, that we're once again coming up against. That's 195,000. And to put that number in context, uh, you could build a tiny home for $15,000. Uh, you could forgive someone's rent 
for a full year for $10,000. You could send someone to school at St. Louis Community College for two years for $7,000. You could hire a social worker with supervision and benefits for $60,000. And that comes out to $94,000. So you could do that twice and then still have $7,000 left over to send someone to community college, third kid, all for the cost of a single police officer. And the case that we're making throughout this is that those investments uh, in education, in housing, in case management, uh, and wraparound services uh, would ultimately reduce violence in our city more than that officer. Um, the other thing I want to draw attention to is just some specific pieces here. So we see, for example, that it costs $4,000 per police officer to provide them with legal representation. Um, it, it just speaks to the level of abuse uh, that, that we see in the city that they require such so much legal representation. We see $7,000 per police officer for fleet maintenance. We see $2,000 per police officer for radio maintenance. We see $1,000 per police officer for professional development. Another $1,000, well, really $900 per police officer for their uniforms and riot gear. And then they weirdly have a $1,000 per police officer budget for travel. Um, and then the last piece I'll draw attention to, and we'll talk about a little bit more later, is overtime. And actually, what I want to highlight is that that $7,500 number it is a significant understatement. It, it reflects the amount that is budgeted for overtime, which is $8.9 million. But the reality, as we saw, thanks to Nicole Galloway, who audited the police department, um, it is that they're spending much more. Um, she found that in 2018, they spent $13.8 million. Um, but uh, our understanding is that it may be as high as $16 million today. And so what do we get for all these resources, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we pour into arrest and incarcerate? Um, we get extremely high levels of violent crime. Um, and that's because the police actually lack the critical resource that they need in order to address violent crime. And that's trust. And, and you can't buy that. Um, but what we believe is, is that in order to actually solve the problem of violence in our city, we need to listen to those closest to the problem. Um, and, and so I wanna talk now about what building a, a new system, um, what building a, a new city, what in particular bringing large amounts of investment in, into North St. Louis um, could look like. And, and again, I wanna uh, kind of zoom out really big first um, to say, as Blake explained, that policing is, fundamentally a mechanism of, of social control, of racial, economic, and patriarchal control. And it is designed and was born out of uh, slave patrols and is designed to maintain a property regime. Um, and I want to briefly shout out, um, uh, we, we have a uh, People's History of Policing event uh, tomorrow that John Chasnoff with CAPCAR is, is holding. I wanna direct everyone to that because we're not gonna be able to go incredibly deep into the history of policing as a mechanism of social control, but encourage everyone to turn there to learn more. But all, all this to say that the abolition of policing actually also entails the abolition of, of poverty. Um, the abolition of, of the necessity for these mechanisms of social control. In, in a world with decommodified housing, with decommodified education and healthcare, where, where there's less scarcity, the need for policing to maintain an inequitable status quo and an inequitable property regime is much less necessary. And that's why I, I really like, uh, it, you may not be able to see it, but this little banner that says the antithesis of police is the commons. And then when we're imagining this new world, we also actually need to reimagine what justice means to us. Um, and right now, justice involves violence. Um, justice involves a sentence. We, we define justice as the right sentence for an individual, which, which fits the crime and the harm done. Um, but that sentence just perpetuates violence. It creates more violence. It feeds the cycle. It, it, uh, rips families apart, uh, it, it creates further trauma. And so there's a need to redefine justice as healing, um, as rehabilitation, 
as a collective process, not, not as a static outcome, but as a dynamic community-driven process, something that we're working towards, something that that healing it isn't just about, or, or justice isn't just about the perpetrator getting the, the right sentence, but it's actually about healing for both the perpetrator and the survivor and recognizing that those are intertwined, that what survivors often want, it isn't vengeance, but it is for the person to make amends, to recognize the harm that they've done um, and, and to change and to have that not happen to someone else. Um, and, and so fundamentally, it, it's a compassionate approach that, that also recognizes that, that the divide we, we draw between survivors and perpetrators um, actually isn't as clean as we might want it to be um, when, when we are uh, dispensing sentences. Because the truth is that perpetrators of violence are almost inevitably victims of trauma. Um, and, and that there is this cycle. And so there's a need to reimagine what justice means and to reimagine what interventions can look like that, that are designed to break this cycle. Um, and I am certainly not the right person to design those, but I can tell you a little bit about funding them. And that's where I'll go next. But I do wanna emphasize that there is an immense amount of work that has been done building new models of transformative justice that, that grow out of indigenous practices, that grow out of practices um, of sex workers that have not been able to rely on calling the police. Um, and I encourage folks to, to read the work of Marianne Caba and Patrice Flores, um, among others, um, to learn more about that work and that vision. On the funding side, um, I want to talk a little bit about what our budget could look like. And I'm going to talk first about corrections and next about police. Um, and that is that our number one priority going to the budget cycle clearly has to be to defund the workhouse, um, to take the prongs of Board Bill 167 um, and, and translate them in, into our budget. Um, and one thing to just kind of bear in mind uh, and have in the back of your mind is that the administration has actually claimed um, back, back in 2020 that closing the workhouse would somehow increase the corrections budget by one and a half million dollars. Um, it, it's not true. Um, it, it relies on a variety of silly assumptions, including the fact um, that the CJC City Justice Center would need to nearly uh, increase its staff by over 100 should the workhouse close, um, making it one of the most overstaffed jails in the country. Um, so, so the truth, of course, is that um, the CJC is currently uh, budgeted for 316 staff members, um, and we think that's more than enough to run the jail, and in fact, could be less. Um, but the question then becomes, what, what do we spend this money on? And, and what is laid out in detail in Board Bill 167 um, is, first of all, a division of supportive reentry. Um, so that's a case management uh, system uh, that, that essentially wraps around people as they move in and out of the criminal legal system um, and, and includes funding for uh, medical expenses, for housing, for food vouchers, transit vouchers, uh, child care, mental health care, et cetera. We also need overdue repairs, better food, improved medical care, um, as well as independent disciplinary processes to investigate incidents of abuse. Because we know that current IRR processes have not been working. Uh, and in fact, we, we hear reports of, of uh, IRR boxes that actually go completely unchecked um, for months, if not longer. Uh, and then finally, we need to think about redesigning the workhouse as a site for rehabilitation and healing, or alternatively, if that proves impossible, selling it to fund such a process. And next, we also need to expand that vision, build on, on that defund demand with the police department. Um, and the first kind of low hanging fruit is really police overtime and vacant positions. So the way it works is that the police have a budget for overtime, and then they have a bit of a slush fund that they use to spend more money on overtime. And that slush fund is made up of their vacant positions where they have over 150 vacancies um, that, that are funded for probably, it's roughly $10 million um, that, that they then use to, to kind of move money around. Uh, and one of the chief places that they move it is police overtime. So we support defunding those vacant positions, defunding police overtime, and also defunding SWAT and shot spotter, uh, which we know again, just compound violence uh, and, and don't really work. And then we also support civilianizing this all in the people's plan, traffic enforcement, problem properties, domestic abuse response, and juvenile and internal affairs. 
um, because we just don't think you need a gun to enforce traffic laws uh, or, or nuisance laws. Um, and, and as we discussed, domestic abuse, one of the pushbacks that we get about the domestic abuse pieces, well, those are some of the most violent calls. Um, but put this in the frame of the re redefining justice that we just talked about. Domestic abuse is massively underreported. Why? Because it doesn't offer people justice, survivors justice. It, it offers trauma and violence. And so the real question, if we are serious about addressing domestic abuse, isn't how do we respond to these crises, although that may be a small piece of the question, but it is how do we build a system that designs interventions that empower more people to take action to prevent domestic abuse. And that needs to be a civilian function because there's just a massive trust gap. Because by the way, police officers, and there's good social science to, to back this up, commit domestic abuse at a much higher rate than the general population. Um, and so what do we need to invest in? Uh, we need to invest in transformative alternatives. We need to invest in nonviolent first responders, violence interrupters, and alternative crisis response and resolution, which will also involve redesigning a 911 system that actually works. Um, and just a note that the city's current diversion programs are less than $1.4 million. Cops and clinicians is 700,000. The BHM diversion is another 700,000. We need to massively expand those. Um, also transferring traffic and problem properties, also trauma-informed investigations and case management so that we can bridge that trust gap so that incident reports and interviews can be conducted by civilians. Um, and then we actually need to transform our physical landscape to, to wrap around communities in need with an intentional encampment, with a sobering center for folks dealing with addictions, with community justice centers where these nonviolent first responders and case management programs can be housed. And then finally, critically, we need in independent investigations of police misconduct. Um, because right now, Internal Affairs and the Force Investigative Unit at SLMPD are, are helping cover up misconduct, uh, not actually provide accountability. So with all that, I'll, I'll pause for questions. We're actually going to go Sorry. ahead and go over to- Yeah, jump I'm in. Kind of <laughs> um, so my name is Madison Orozco, um, and I'm the Community Collaborations Fellow at Arc City Defenders. We use she, her pronouns. Um, and I just want to note that we are running a little bit behind. So um, we're going to have a question portion that's going to go past 7.30. So if you have questions, hope that you're able to stick around. But it, you can also drop them in the chat, and we can be answering them throughout the time that I'm talking as well. So um, I'm going to cover this last portion, the anti-surveillance prong of um, the re-envisioning public safety portion of the People's Plan. And so it's going to include a conversation with Alicia Hernandez of Privacy Watch um, around anti-surveillance work in St. Louis, as well as examining electronic monitoring and the impact of private probation with Jocelyn, who we just heard from earlier. And, you know, I had already kind of prepared a general thing to talk about the danger of surveillance and how we know that state surveillance like this really uh, targets and impacts uh, Black Black folks and unhoused folks more than anyone, but you can even look on the news today and see that with the security breach, if you haven't heard that happened at this ton of tech security startup company um, in Silicon Valley that gave hackers access to over 150,000 security cameras in hospitals, jails, gyms, police stations, like Tesla factories, like all over was a really big deal. And even led to this quote by a law professor at American University, called, sorry, American University Washington College of Law, which said this breach should be a wake up call to the dangers of self surveillance. We are building networks of surveillance we cannot escape without really thinking about the consequences. Our desire for some fake sense of security is its own security threat. So with that frame of mind, I want to pass it over to Alicia. Alicia is here representing Privacy Watch um, and is an organizer who has been very involved in the anti-surveillance work here in St. Louis. So I'll pass it over to you now, Alicia, and thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Madison. Um, so to sort of lay out the, the local landscape for you, um, St. Louis City has poured $4 million into police surveillance technology and the real-time crime center. Uh, without any community input or control. As of an audit in 2019, we know that the Real-Time Crime Center provides, provides St. Louis police with eyes and ears all over the city through cameras, license plate readers, sensors that detect and locate gunfire, uh, shot spotters, um, and seven surveillance trailers that move throughout the city 
You've maybe seen these at protests or outside of your home, uh, in your community. Uh, so these stream directly to the Real-Time Crime Center. Uh, and there are video feeds from cameras that the police department owns, as well as cameras owned by the street department and the port authority. So as you can see on this slide, it is absolutely a web of police surveillance. And all of this without any reporting, transparency, or accountability in place. We don't know how long the data is stored. We don't know who has access to it. We don't know what is done with it. We don't know how this technology is being used versus its stated intention. Um, we have no idea of its effectiveness, um, and we don't know if federal agents such as ICE could tap into this technology, and we know that uh, federal agencies like ICE have used local surveillance to target undocumented people. Um, so what we do know is that police surveillance has time and time again been proven to be ineffective, yet harmful to Black communities and the unhoused um, and undocumented people. So what we've been doing in Privacy Watch, uh, it, we are a coalition and we've been working to project a vision of public safety that's based on building communities, supporting community, and actually getting at the root cause of crime instead of being over surveilled um, with surveillance that is not only racist, but absolutely unconstitutional. So some ways that we've been doing that recently is we've been trying to pass Board Bill 95. So this is a surveillance oversight bill that would uh, mandate that our communities are actually giving meaningful opportunity to review and participate in the decisions about uh, if and how surveillance technology would be acquired, how it would be used. This bill would also create a civilian oversight board, which we always love, of the police technology so that we know how current police surveillance data is being used and to determine if these programs are even cost effective, if we want these in our communities. Um, and so to keep the conversation going, this could be a great tool to keep spy planes out of the city. So you've probably heard a lot about spy planes um, really over the last like year and a half. Uh, so most recently um, on December 12th, 2020, Oldenburg introduced Board Bill 20, creating a contract with a company called Persistent Surveillance Systems. Um, this would permit a privately owned company to fly spy planes over St. Louis City. Uh, this was not the first time that we had confronted this threat of spy planes, and it's probably not going to be the last time, honestly. So Persistent Surveillance Systems, LLC, is a privately owned company. It is ma it's a mass surveillance system that was developed by the military to wage war in Iraq. Um, so using this in St. Louis, we know would put the entire city under the eyes of our government and a privately owned company without any regulations. Um, I think we all know what that would mean and what kind of consequences that would have. Um, so uh, we are fairly certain that this bill is done for this session. So this aldermanic session ends on April 19th, but the sponsor has stated that he is interested in bringing this back. So we are absolutely gonna keep an eye on this and um, inform everyone of, on how the concern with spy planes moves. And on a good note, uh, Board Bill 95, our surveillance oversight bill, will absolutely keep y'all informed on that too. Great, thank you so much, Alicia. And now, well, can you go ahead and just click through the, like all the things on there? Cause I might be talking through it a little quickly. Um, so another type of surveillance that we see and is really prevalent is electronic monitoring. So what is electronic monitoring? Well, it's a form of surveillance that uses an electronic device fixed to a person. So in most cases, like an ankle monitor. And so like what we've been talking about with pretrial detention, like what should happen is that you should be released um, and to return on your own recognizance so that you will come back for your court date. But what ends up happening and what we see happening with cash bail is that if you can pay you can get out, but if not, then you can't. Well, an additional barrier, additional step being added is this electronic monitoring, this um, e-carceration basically, um, in which you are able to, you might be able to pay your bail and be able to get out of jail at that time, but a condition of your release is to have this electronic monitoring um, as a part of, uh, of surveillance around you, as a part of the condition of you being able to be released. 
And so oftentimes the ability to afford something like this, as I'll talk about a bit more when I talk about pricing, is not considered. Um, and when it's, uh, when it's given to someone and people try and portray it as like, oh, this is a better option. There is a pushback against cash bail. We don't want to be keeping people in jail when they shouldn't be in jail. Let's use this. This is a great alternative, but it's not. Um, these things not only um, really shift the cost of the burden of surveillance from the city or state to the person who themselves is being monitored, but then it also creates this huge profit industry where these private companies are being brought in to be like these third party operators to manage this surveillance. And so people who are uh, being surveilled who have to be wearing these ankle monitors are the ones who have to pay and they're not paying the city or the state, they're paying these private companies. And so you, when you're released pre-trial, you're expected to basically immediately within 24 hours, go and register um, and pay for a monitor, which can be like $10 a day at least, um, and has at least a $50 installation fee. And sometimes some of that money is due upfront. So we can clearly see here that people try to push it as something that's gonna be, oh, this is great. Like, you know, this is moving us in the right direction. But the reality is that it really is a profit scheme that doesn't really make things easier for people, especially considering that when you have these electronic uh, monitors on, you have to be making sure it's charged all the time. You need to be making sure that you are where you are supposed to be. You have to make it to weekly check-ins with the monitoring companies. Um, none of these things are inflexible at all. And if you're unable to pay, if, you, if it dies, something happens, you can go back to jail. You can be rearrested if you're unable to pay. Um, and so just at the bottom, electronic monitoring, basically private probation, probation being kind of like sent out to a third party to be able to handle it. Um, and people, the people who are, you know, being the people who are being um, surveilled are the ones who and the people having to pay for it are the ones that have the least resources to do so. Next slide, please. Um, again, now I'll just click all of them. Um, and so what does it look like specifically in St. Louis? So you might have heard the term EMAS and thought that meant like electric monitoring something, something, something. Well, it's actually a company, um, a private company, Eastern Missouri Alternative Sentencing Services. And so this is like one of those third party operators that I'm talking about um, that has a contract typically with the city and those are typically done at the local level um, to host to, to do this type of surveillance. And for the city, this option is more cost efficient for them because then they're not having to pay to house someone and all of the burden is falling on that person themselves. So judges have indicated that they're reluctant to let people out of jail pretrial or let people out pretrial when they should be out um, because they fear the optics of if a person reoffends or doesn't show up to their court date. So basically that's like a fancy way of saying they worry more about like politics and what it looks like than respecting the constitutional rights of people who have not been convicted of a crime. And we'll say it over and over and over again, pre-trial, you are not convicted of a crime. So basically, along with a tremendous financial burden that this is putting on people, it also puts this huge mental burden on these people who must use private probation, this nonstop surveillance, simply because you've been accused of a crime. And all of a sudden, the authorities are aware of every move you make, every place where you are, everything that you're doing, potentially who you're with, all of this, and you haven't even been convicted of a crime. You can go to the next slide. Um, and so, work that we've been doing around this electronic monitoring here in St. Louis. So in January, 2019, Arch City Defenders, along with um, a lot of other organizations that you can kind of see the headers on there, um, sent a joint letter to the judges and court administrator of the 22nd circuit, uh, judicial circuit, calling out the use of these private pretrial services and saying that these people are basically threatening people that don't have the resources um, and telling them that, you know, if you can't pay, then you're gonna have to go back to jail. Um, and so it outlined how these things violate people's rights, the experiences that people have had and concluded with recommendations. And from that, what has happened is that we see that the city's contract with EMAS is now set to expire. So they're potentially gonna be contracting with other private companies, which doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be any better. And there is now a process where people can apply to have their costs covered and waived, but that is also, there's still obstacles there and that's not a guarantee. Um, but I wanna pass it over to Jocelyn for a bit, just to let her um, talk a bit about her experience with electronic monitoring through EMAS and just what that was like for you and how that impacted you. Well, from, I didn't realize that I was even on EMAS until let's just say, you know, until I got out. 
okay, <laughs> which was the day of me signing my release paper. So that was a condition of my uh, that was a condition of my bond. So and within and within twenty four hours, you have to report to this place. Now with the monitor, there is a three hundred dollar service fee in order to get this monitor first put on. Now for someone that's coming spending five to six months in jail, where do you think that money's coming from? Yeah. You know, I know you know my job situation because that's asked about my financials whenever we're first, you know, uh, booked in and everything. And also whenever you go to try to attain an attorney. So, you know, my financial information, you know, there's no way someone like myself is going to get out and within 24 hours come up with $300 unless I'm doing something illegal. Okay, then. So once you've got that $300 covered, it's $150 a month. Now, how am I then supposed to look for a job or be any productive with this big monitor on my ankle? You think they care about that? They don't care about that. So then the problem becomes now I'm not even so much as focused on my case as I am about this EMAS thing, because now you've taken on a whole nother beast, you know? So, and my only crime to go back to jail for this would be not being able to pay it, but I don't have any resources. So through the grace of God and some of, you know, our city and, you know, the Bell Project or whatever, we were able to talk to these people and make it to where, okay, I didn't have to necessarily just get the monitor and pay the 150 a month where I could still pay, but I would still have to pay $30 a month. And for what? To just come in, answer a couple of questions on the sheet and leave. But now I haven't committed a crime. The judge saw fit enough to give me a bond, a reasonable bond for me to be able to get out. And from my understanding, if I'm that much of a threat, I wouldn't have got a bond at all. Mm. So why then am I still paying to retain my freedom? You're already treating me as guilty when allegedly I've done these things. <laughs> That's right. And what is freedom when you're under that level of surveillance? Is it really freedom when you're not able to go where all the places that you need to go and you're only allowed to be in a certain place and you're expected to be here at a certain time and you have to make all these other arrangements and things? Exactly. Exactly. And not, not to cut you off, but, but, but just to address the issue of safety on that, the, I would say that as like a 50-50 thing. If you have the monitor, yeah, I can see because they can constantly track where you are. But if you get to the state to where I was, to where you have no, no electronic monitoring, you know, you're just paying that, that $30 a month, you could be anywhere. You could be anywhere doing anything. Mm -hmm. So it's not a safety thing because there's nothing to protect you from me or anyone else if we want or, you know, if they want to do anything to you when it comes to that. It's just about money. And no one even knows what it is, what it's exactly. for, why it's even in place. Exactly. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. We really appreciate it. Um, so that's what we have for this section. And again, just want to like Jocelyn, like Jocelyn's experience is what so many people are experiencing every single day in this system that a lot of legislators and people are trying to pass off as a good alternative to what we have. So we clearly see that this is not the right direction and this is not where we need to be going. Um, want to open the space for questions about my section, but also any other questions. I know there was a question for um, Noel, for, for Noel's portion in the chat. So Noel, you can also feel free to kind of jump in and answer that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm mindful of time. Um, so here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to give the, the last little um, pieces of, of um, information we wanted to give for those who have to leave. And then for those who did have any questions or reactions they wanted to lift up, we're going to stick around um, and, and take questions and try to answer them to the best of our ability. Um, but, but before we do that, just so that we honor folks' time, um, for those who do have to go, can, can you pull back up the slides really quickly and just share with folks. First, thank you all so much for being here. Um, we know we, we gave a lot of information tonight, a lot to digest. Um, and, you know, we really hope that you'll um, be able to sort of pick up on the, some of the information we provided, as well as go visit the People's Plan site and really dig in and, and find ways to stay involved. Um, if you could go to the very end, Nawel, um, we this is the second in, I think, a five-part series, ACD Live series that, that we're doing, so we definitely want you all to 
Um, if you're not already on our listserv, you can go to our website, archcitydefenders.org and sign up for our email list and you'll get information about at what the dates are going to be for the upcoming ACD lives, one on what's really happening in courts, specifically the municipal and landlord tenant courts in the St. Louis region. That's the next one. It'll be sometime at the end of this month, details to follow. In April, we're gonna be talking about debtors prisons in rural Missouri. And then in May, um, what we're calling paying, paying the bills, um, direct client financial rental utility assistance. There's been a huge uptick in need for that. And, and many of our uh, social work staff and um, support staff have been working very hard to make sure that um, we're supporting people as best we can, but we wanna talk about some of the need and what that looks like. So just wanted to put this on your radar. Um, and as always, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, if, if you need to contact us, this is all of our information, uh, phone 314 6 sorry, 314-361-8834 or toll free 855-724-2489. You can also reach us at mail at Arch City Defenders or intake at Arch City Defenders if um, you are requesting any, any kind of services. And of course, visit us online. So uh, thank you all again so much for being here. Maybe we'll circle back now to the um, questions and reflection and Madison was teeing up that there was at least one uh, question in the chat that I know Trey put there. Um, now, well, I don't know. I have some thoughts, but but if you want to take that up, was uh was the graph you're referring to, Trey? Uh, this graph. Yep. Now, now, well, before you answer, can you read the question out loud for people who are on the Facebook Live? W would you mind doing that actually? Because I can't see it yes. here. Yes, that's fine. Thinking. Yes. Uh, Trey, had asked, Trey had asked, can you talk a little more about the connection slash correlation between an increase in police and an increase in violence uh, related to the graph that was shown? Yeah, so just to clarify this graph, this graph actually doesn't show uh, the number of police either on an absolute rate or per capita um, in St. Louis. And unfortunately, I don't have that data at my fingertips, so I don't, I, I can't calculate the correlation right now between uh, police and violence. Um, what I can mention is that what this really shows is that the uptick in violence in St. Louis and the, in the homicide rate um, and in the absolute level of homicides um, was related to a, a decline in population, which in turn was related to white flight um, and a massive uh, disinvestment uh, from North St. Louis. The other two things that, that I'll note here are one, that this graph is a little bit out of date. It ends at 2011, but in fact, unfortunately, 2020 uh, has been the highest um, number of homicides that the city has seen in 50 years since 1970. Um, we've had 262 homicides. Um, and, and the other thing I'll note um, is that uh, Mariam Kava has this really great line, where, which is essentially like, we need to include violence perpetrated by the criminal legal system in the kind of violence that we are trying to address. And so to speak to your question, Trey, about the correlation um, between police and violence, I think it's incredibly important to emphasize that, as Blake noted, 94% of arrests are for nonviolent offenses. And so that is the system responding to a nonviolent offense with an incredibly violent response of ripping people away from their families, um, destroying people's lives, often creating a lot of trauma. Um, and so it does seem to me reasonable to believe that when you are introducing so much violence, that that will then have ripple effects and, and instigate cycles of, of harm and violence. And so I wouldn't be surprised when we do calculate this um, to actually see that St. Louis's uh, number of police officers per capita has also increased in line with these, in part because it's also driven by the population decline. But those are a few thoughts. Uh, so I see another, um, question in the chat directed at me. I mentioned earlier not, not loving the term recidivism. Uh, and I think this is Jessica that asked uh, what terms or language I feel is more appropriate. Uh, so let me say first, the reason that I'm not wild about um, the term recidivism is because I think it frames the issue entirely as one of personal responsibility and, and fault, individual fault that um, you know, recidivism suggests that people are making the same choices over and over again that are landing them back. And the question then becomes, how do we fix these people so that they don't land in these, these recidivism stats? 
And what I, the, the frame that I think is actually much more useful and much more accurate um, is to, to apply a more systemic frame and to think about it in terms of who the criminal legal system is more likely to impact, who it's more likely to, to capture. Um, and so I see the, the, the system itself playing a very active role in choosing who's being arrested, who's being charged, who's being sentenced, how long they're being sentenced. And so when someone is being brought into the system again and again and again, one way of understanding that is as a personal failure. Another way of understanding it is as a system failure. Because if in fact what we're trying to do when someone is experiencing some, some traumatic event the first time around is change the circumstances in their lives such that they're unlikely to, to find themselves in those circumstances again, it just shows that we're not actually doing that. We're not actually uh, correcting, even though we call it a system of corrections, right? So that's, that's really the reason. It's not that I have you know, a preferred word to replace recidivism. It's that I tend to think much more in terms of criminalization, in terms of arrests, in terms of you know, mass incarceration, and not so much in terms of those kind of individual, um, individualized frames. Any Thanks, other questions? Yeah, I was going to say, do we have any other questions? Uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself to ask or drop them in the chat. Oh, see one just in the chat. A big long one. Uh, is, yes, Alicia is still here. So the, the question is about Privacy Watch slash citizen oversight. You spoke to the goal of the public's oversight over how tech is used. Is that group also looking into the bias and the technologies chosen? Sorry if building the group slash citizen oversight committee is the goal, and I missed that. Absolutely. So our coalition um, is a coalition of various organizations and individual activists. And so we we aren't just looking at oversight as the like end goal. Um, we absolutely understand the harm that surveillance and the bias that comes with it. Uh, so that that is also a part of our conversations and our organizing. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, if if there are other other questions um, or any anything that prompts outreach. Um, we've told you how you can get in touch with us. I just really want to, um, again, thank everyone for being here and tuning in tonight. Uh, I especially want to thank our amazing, incredible guests who joined us, um, Alicia and Jocelyn, um, friends, partners. Uh, we really love and appreciate y'all and, and thank you for being here. Um, and yeah, we hope that this was um, helpful information. We hope it was educational. We hope you learned something you didn't know. Um, and we really, really hope that you will go check out the, the People's Plan, check out those resource guides and um, make good use of those, plug into those campaigns, learn more about the organizations um, and support this work. I think we have a real opportunity um, in the months ahead to, to um, push for a real paradigm shift. And so we're really excited about, about building on this work together and with all of you. So thank you again for being here tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Jocelyn. Bye, Jocelyn. <laughs> I love all of you. Love, love you. you. <laughs> <laughs>